I want to talk to you about our excavation and thank you those who put these out. Uh, this is about our dig. I want to talk to you about archaeology. I want to talk to you about Israel. I want to talk to you about the Bible. But it all centers in who we just read about in John chapter 3, Jesus. Uh, all of this makes sense because of who he is and what he did. And so today I want to encourage you in your own spiritual walk, in your own ministry, and I want to encourage you to consider how all of this archaeology stuff can in fact enhance your walk and enhance your ministry. Well, this is, uh, this is the excavation. I guess if I would get out of the way, that would really help, wouldn't it? All right, this is, uh, this is where we'll be uh, excavating. Uh, I've been there, we've been, uh, this is our 10th season. And um, I want to talk to you about the value of archaeology uh, in, in, in biblical studies and, and, in fact, in ministry. Archaeology helps us to trust the Bible for the past. Now, we do not need archaeology to trust the Bible. I do not like the statement, uh, I'll go somewhere to speak and someone will say, uh, uh, Gary Byers is here and he's going to tell us how archaeology proves the Bible. I don't think, really, I don't think archaeology proves the Bible. Archaeology does demonstrate that we can trust the Bible for the past. You know the real proof that the Bible is God's Word? is not what we excavate in the ground. The real proof that the Bible is God's word, the bottom line, at least for me, is the fact that that book changed my life. If you had known me in high school, uh, uh, a church kid even, but did not have a personal relationship with God, and then what's happened in my life since that time, the only explanation is that there really is a God the Bible can be trusted, and it really does make a difference. The real proof of the Bible is not in archaeology, but in the impact it has in a person's life. But archaeology does help us to trust the Bible for the past. So let me talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, our excavation, I actually run two different digs uh, in, the, in the Holy Land. One is on the Jordanian side. Tal el Hammam, uh, in the eastern side of the Jordan River Valley, and the other where we're talking about, Kirbet el Makadar, in the West Bank of Israel. Now, it just so happens that the two sites that I dig at every year, those two sites relate to the story of the conquest. The Israelites uh, camping out at Abel Shittim. Most scholars, even, even before anything from our excavation, most scholars have put Abel Shittim at our dig site. And so they camped out there last on the east side of the Jordan and then crossed the Jordan to the Promised Land. Of course, uh, camped in Gilgal, defeated Jericho, and then the second city they attacked was the city of Ai. And so it's been my privilege to be connected in that, that whole story. Today we're going to focus on this site, and this is a place well, I'd like to invite you to come and join us uh, to dig, uh, uh, to dig history, to dig biblical truth, uh, to have a permanent impact on your spiritual life and on your ministry. Uh, this is a site, this is looking, here we are in the Jordan River Valley, we're at Tel El Hammam, uh, Abel Shittim, and we're looking uh, west, uh, Jericho, the mound of Jericho is right there, the Jordan River flows through there. This is the Jordan River Valley. And then up in the hills, right up there, that is the location of Kirbet uh, el Makadar. We believe it's the city of Ai that Joshua captured. Now we just turned around. We're at Kirbet el Makadar, the city of Ai, looking back and you can see the Jordan River Valley. And we actually were just right in this area uh, right here. This is the modern uh, Palestinian village of Deir Dubois. I'll tell you a little bit about that in just a minute. Now, um, some of you remember the, uh, uh, the scientific method in, in high school. Uh, some of us really didn't pay attention to that in high school. Uh, I vaguely remembered it. But when I began to do archaeology, I realized that archaeology, in fact, 
uh, is fulfilling the scientific method. So it's, it's not a treasure hunt like we're familiar with, with Indiana Jones, but it is in fact a scientific investigation. And as archeologists, we need to be honest with the evidence in the ground, but no surprise, time after time after time, the evidence in the ground fits exactly what, what the Bible says. And that's why we say that archeology span demonstrates that you can trust the Bible for the past for history. And so this is the scientific method in archeology. span And um, as, we, as we do archeological span research, there's actually five lines of evidence that we use. Textual, of course, the scriptures. But there's other ancient texts that, that, are, that are of value. And then the geographical, the right location, topographical, the topography with rivers and mountains and, and desert appropriately fits. Uh, chronological data basically centers on pottery. Occasionally you find a text that's helpful, but generally it's pottery that's used for chronology. And then the archeological data, the city of Ai was destroyed and it was burned. We need to find that evidence. We have found such evidence, which is one of the reasons why we think our site's appropriate. The pottery says it's the right time for the biblical story. The topography and the geography fit the biblical text. Let me just to, to tie this together for you a little bit. We, uh, our third or fourth year, we sent a report into um, uh, Israel Exploration Journal. They would take uh, yearly reports about our dig. And so we sent the annual archaeological report, the, the data from the excavation that year. And then the last two paragraphs suggested an identification of our site with the city of Ai that was destroyed by Joshua. The editor of Israel Exploration Journal sent us a message back. And Dr. Bryant Wood is the one who, who, who wrote the report. He sent a message back and he said, really... Uh, in this archaeological report, we really don't want to be doing biblical material. We just want to deal with the facts. And so Brian sent them a letter back and said, well, we appreciate that, but unless you use the Bible, there's no discussion about the city of Ai in any other ancient text. If we're going to talk about the city of Ai, we have to use the Bible. And they said, well, I guess that's a reasonable approach. So we'll, uh, we'll let you include that, uh, that part of the discussion. So uh, this is a scientific endeavor. And of course, for us, the Bible is the primary source. And, it's, it's, it, and it is. But it is one of many lines of evidence we use to do good archaeology. And to be honest, uh, sometimes what we find doesn't fit our preconceptions of what we thought it would be. But we do not find the Bible to be wrong. It just, that's, not what, that's not the kind of thing that happens. So let me talk to you about our site in particular. Um, the city of Ai is mentioned twice in, in two, well, three places in the Bible. One in the story of Abraham, uh, second in the story of Joshua, and third, the men of Bethel and Ai returned uh, from the uh, uh, captivity back to their region. Doesn't say they went right back to their city, but back to their region. Archaeologists in the 1970s excavated Etel, and they said, we have found the city of Ai. They said, we have the right site, but the Bible was wrong in the way it described it. It was, it was exactly, it was what the Bible said in Abraham's day, but it doesn't fit what the Bible said in Joshua's day. We've got the right site, the Bible was just wrong in how it described it. We decided we didn't agree with that. And so the founder of the Associates for Biblical Research spent 30 years all over this area of the West Bank. Remember, taking the Bible, we've got geographical data, we've got topographical data, we've got chronological data, and we've got archeological data. So we've got all this information. And so using that information, uh, he, and then later on, uh, Dr. Bryant Wood systematically went through uh, the region looking at sites based on potteries that were found, based on uh, remains that were showing, based on historical records. And uh, we wound up at, uh, this is one, two hills away, it's one kilometer away, 
we wound up at Kirbet el Makader. Now, uh, at Kirbet el Makader, we found the evidence that fit the Joshua story. It absolutely fit what we were reading in Joshua. But it really, really didn't fit what was mentioned in Abraham's day. So it is our working hypothesis that the eye of Abraham's day in Genesis was in fact Etel. It was a ruin, just archaeologically we find a ruin, just like it was said in Abraham's day, the ruin, Ha'ai. And so that is, we believe, the eye of Abraham's day, and in fact, this is the eye of Joshua's day. Say, I don't know. Now, it's, it's, um, it's 1,500 years later. The name, same name, has moved one kilometer, two hills. Say, I don't know if I really like that. And Well, and I would understand that. But in fact, it's not uncommon for place names to move from location to location. Uh, ever heard of Mount Zion? I, you're not nodding, but I'm, I'm assuming you have. I, Mount Zion is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in the Bible. But if you go to Israel today and they'll, you go to Jerusalem, they will tell you Mount Zion is not the eastern hill, but the western hill. So even Holy Zion, that name moved from one hill to another. And so I don't find it a problem that the name Ha'ai moved from uh, Etel, two hills over, one kilometer, to Kilbet al-Makadar over those 500 years, when it was just a ruin in Abraham's day, and it was a living city in Joshua's day. Well, that's part of the research. That's part of the work that we're doing. And, and um, others maybe not see it that way, but I think that actually does fit exactly what the Bible says. And then just to note, if, if you're going to read Joshua chapter 7 and 8 about the story of Joshua capturing I, the city of Bethel and the city of Beth Avon, and archaeologically and historically, we think we can identify those sites as well. So topographically, geographically, chronologically, and then we're going to look at some of the archaeological data. Uh, we think that's in fact what we're finding. And this is a, this is a big issue. When Old Testament scholars uh, want to want to work the Bible over, they love to go to the issue of I, and they say, uh, "Well, uh, there's no there's no city of I that Joshua destroyed. In fact, we've got really good evidence right here." But of course, then one of the other problems is they date the time of the conquest uh, at a different time uh, than we think the Bible does, and so there's all these challenges. But this is really exciting stuff. When you begin to dig with your own hands, the stuff that comes from the time and we think the place from the story of Joshua. Well, let's look at that a little bit. Here's, um, this is Route 60. This is the Israeli security road that goes north from Jerusalem all the way up uh, uh, through the West Bank, ends up at, at the city of Shechem. Uh, uh, this is this is a modern road. The way of the patriarchs is over here, oh, about one mile, going north this way, through right through the heart of all the Palestinian, the modern Palestinian villages, which are be, built on ancient biblical sites. And so this is the security road the Israelis use. Our site is located right on the edge of that security road. Now, right there also is Givyat Asaf, which is a Jewish settlement. One of, you know, you hear in the news, the illegal Jewish settlements on the West Bank. That's how it's often referred to. Uh, it's, it's not, but that's how it's, it's called. And so this is Givyat Asaf. These are our Jewish neighbors. And then there's that village of Deir Dubois. Those are our Palestinian neighbors. And of course, we're there once a year. And uh, we have developed a really wonderful relationship with both. Now you would uh, you would you would think that that would be difficult in the West Bank if you listen to CNN all the time, but that's not the way it is. In fact, we 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 don't have any difficulty in our work there. Uh, we've developed good relationship with both Palestinians and Jews, and it's become a a, a, a platform of appropriate ministry and 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 sharing uh, with with both groups. 
Well, there's our site. That's Kirbet Omicotter. Basically, three periods. There's the Old Testament fortress of Joshua's day, and that's, that's what we're most interested in. That's what we went there for. But as archaeologists, you're going to dig down and you're going to, you got to deal with what's there. And sometimes you'll like what's there. This is cool. I didn't know that was there. And sometimes it's not. But you're going to be honest with the data. You're going to do real archaeology. Systematically, you dig through. So there's the Old Testament city. Much larger New Testament fort. And there's also a later Byzantine church and monastery. Now, the Byzantines always built their churches and their monasteries on biblical sites, ref uh, reflecting biblical people or events. Uh, there's, there's no known New Testament story from this location. And so they built this monastery here for something, presumably an Old Testament story. The number one Old Testament story that fits this location is the story of Joshua defeating the city of Ai. What we really want to find as we excavate the monastery <laughs> is a uh, mosaic uh, inscription that says uh, Joshua and the city of Ai. Haven't found it yet, but we have great promise that that still can, uh, can be there. So we'll, we'll look a little bit at, uh, at what these uh, finds are. These are just some of those who are involved with the excavation. Dr. Bryant Wood, uh, he is the, the director. Uh, many of you maybe know Dr. Gene Merrill from Dallas Seminary. Uh, that's uh, uh, Lane Rittmeyer, Dr. Lane Rittmeyer. He's the famous guy that does all the writing on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Uh, Dr. Rittmeyer is, is the archaeological architect on both of the digs that I work on. And when I introduce him to, a, to a, a, an audience, I, I, I say, and it's true, no man alive, Jew, Muslim, or Christian, has seen, drawn, photographed, and measured more of the Temple Mount than Rittmeyer. And so he's, uh, he's quite a guy, and we're very fortunate to have him with us, and that's Dr. Scott Stripling, who's excavating the monastery. I'm the administrative director uh, with, with that crew. That actually is me. My claim to fame was I found the, the gate socket stone at the city of Ai back in 1975, and that's what really got the excavation started. Bryant and I came over. We uh, scoured out the land and uh, identified this particular site as a, a good candidate to be I, based on geography, based on topography, based on chronology of the, the date of the pottery that we're finding on the surface, and then we needed to find, to excavate to find archaeological data. And this was the thing that really got us started. The gate socket stone happened to be sitting on the surface. A second gate socket stone was found nearby, a, 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 an upper gate socket stone. These are the two lower ones, and then you have, have two upper ones. Uh, one of those was found. I'm actually sitting on one of the stones that was part of the, uh, the gatehouse. Just one layer of stones was left. It, uh, I, I actually wanted to show you a picture of it, but it's, it is so unimpressive that I thought, I don't even show you a picture of that, but that was, that was uh, the gatehouse. The gate of the city of Ai was really important in, in the story. Now, here's, here's what we found. The Bible says that uh, the city of Ai was a small place. It's smaller than Gibeon, and we know what Gibeon was like. And so uh, uh, we think it was about two and a half to three acres. Here was the gate area. That's, that's where all that got started. And then we began to excavate part of the city wall. Uh, and, uh, and we think it probably went circular about like that. Uh, we've been working in this area. This area is now off limits to us, but we found the, just the evidence of this gate tower, and then I want to show you this storage pit inside the city. So the gate probably looked like that. It was uh, Dr. Rittmeyer did this reconstruction based on our site, and then what he's excavated, what he has uh, drawn from so many other sites. It, uh, a gate, typical gate tower had a uh, typical gateway, gate complex, had two towers uh, on each side. We found, clear, we, we found one of the gate towers. The other one was completely gone all the way to bedrock. Uh, we found, um, and then there's a passageway right through the gate, and, and we found wall up to the gate. We found one gate tower, but that was all we found. But that's a really important. The Bible says it faced north in the Joshua story, and that's exactly where ours faces. And then there's this southern tower 
on the edge of the wall uh, that was from the uh, uh, later, or at the other end of the site, and the southern end of the site. So at the north end was the gate, at the south end was a tower. Uh, then inside the city, people would build their homes, and in their homes, they would, they would carve out of the solid bedrock either water cisterns or storage uh, silos, uh, subterranean storage silos. Well, we excavated just, excavating a square, you just, you dig all the dirt down to bedrock. And so here they uncovered bedrock, and, and, and there's, this, there's this hole with a stone put on top as a lid. Well, I've seen Indiana Jones movies. I mean, you open that stuff, and who knows what's down there. So we opened it, and out popped a Canaanite. <laughs> now, just for the record, um, I, I, don't, I don't dig tombs. Um, I don't dig storage pits. Uh, there's plenty of young college guys and girls that love to get down there, but they got, they got little creepy crawler things down there, and I just don't like those. So I don't go in, but there's always young guys and girls that are willing to do that. So he cleaned it out. You want to know what was in there? Nothing. Just dirt. Nothing. Uh, it probably was a grain storage silo, or uh, could have been could have been a cistern. We just we just could not tell. Uh, then there's the western wall of the city. Uh, the wall of Joshua's day was here, and then the, new, the 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 Hasmoneans extended it over here. We excavated that down to bedrock. Not much left, but that what was there. A house from the time of the book of, Ju uh, book of Judges, built into the northern city wall, one house here, uh, another one there, just starting that work. This was a, a, a New Testament era Roman tomb, again, cut into bedrock. Uh, we have uh, half a dozen of those around the site. Uh, a Jewish mikvah from the New Testament city that was there uh, inside uh, the city, uh, steps down, plastered walls, a, 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 an open area to... Uh, 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 for baptism, for a ritual immersion. Um, I cannot think of Randy's name. Taught at Master's College. Randy Cook, thank you. That's Randy Cook. We, we called that Cook's Pit. Um, we, we, uh, a bunch of Master's College students were with us, and uh, Randy had an extra week. So we, he started digging this area. His students left, and he just kept digging and digging and digging and digging. And, he, and what was there was this, this grain silo with full of Byzantine pottery down there. And we just left Randy in his hole day in and day out. And he got to the bottom of things. And uh, it was uh, a lot of fun, but just completely covered over, no idea it was there. Uh, full of Byzantine pottery, which means it was used during the days of the monastery, but may well have been dug earlier. Now there's the monastery. Uh, where we will still hope to find an inscription. Uh, and of course, we want it to say something about Joshua or I, but we would take whatever's there. That, that's what's there. But this is the monastery, and you can see these houses in the back. This is a Palestinian village. Um, we, we think of, of the, the poor Palestinians, and in many cases, they really are. But this is known as the Beverly Hills of the West Bank. Everybody who lives in these Palestinian homes, every, every home has somebody who is presently living in America and somebody who is an American citizen. And they've worked out these deals and they're back and forth to the U.S., a lot of them in, in the uh, uh, southwest of the United States. And the guy that lives in this particular house has become our friend. And in typical Middle Eastern hospitality, he says... You are my friends, you are my guests in my village. And so when we're here, he, and we've had no problems with Palestinians at all, but he makes sure that there are no problems. He takes care of anything that we need uh, as, a, as, a, as a friend, as a host to his guests. In fact, he stores our tools there in that beautiful home. He stores all our, all our art, dirty archaeological stuff in the... It, in the ground floor level. He's been a wonderful friend to us. Uh, it's, it, 
you would not realize the kind of relationships we have on an annual basis, day by day, with the local people. Uh, this is the the uh, the, uh, the this is the church, the chapel part of the monastery complex. Uh, there's a uh, a capital that was found inside. Uh, there's the uh, the uh, the pillar that it came from and the base that it once stood on would have been about 12 foot high uh, ceiling. That that whole bay, it, whole pillar, it's about eight eight or nine feet long. It was completely buried. We had no idea it was there, and we can only hope that it will still be there when we get back, because uh, when nobody's around, stuff does disappear, and so you don't like to leave anything exposed even overnight. We do know that our neighbors will stop by for a visit. And if there's anything that they can find and sell on eBay, they will. And they do. And so we're very careful about if we find something today and we can't finish it, we bury it so they don't know it's there. And then we come back and finish it uh, the next day. And that's what the monastery would have would have looked like, we think. Uh, then there's, um, now we're trying to find the city of Joshua, but there's this New Testament era stuff keeps popping up and uh, we simply have to deal with it. Now here's the only part that we that we know of uh, is is this although we there's going to be more over here but we have this part this large room and then do you see what we call a window wall there two windows and a doorway and it's an interior wall not an exterior wall. So this was a window wall to another smaller room in this uh, house. Uh, here's the plan that Dr. Rittmeyer did. Uh, we were just over here looking this way. Here's the window wall and this room right here. Now, archaeologically, uh, when, you, when, we, when we look at archaeological evidence, and I think a correct look at the biblical text suggests that in, in, in old and New Testament eras, stables were part of domestic dwellings. Uh, they were not off on the South 40. They were part of the family house, domestic stables. And regularly, when archaeologists find these window walls, they suggest that that next room is in fact a domestic stable. So here we are, 15 miles north of Bethlehem uh, from the same time as the Christmas story, and I would simply suggest to you that we're in a, a, a stable, and so when you think of where Jesus was born and laid in a manger, I think you need to think like this and not something else. Also in that house was a, a huge storage silo, big enough for them to have a party down there. Uh, again, this old guy, he didn't get down there until it's all clean, but them, those young people, they love to get down in there. And so inside, this, there was the, the, the hole, inside there would have been jars and jars and jars of grain uh, stored for this house. And so this was probably a, a pretty nice uh, setup. And, and then there's the same house, that would be the stable. This is actually the opening to the cistern, uh, to the, the storage silo. And now just this last year, we believe we found the city wall of Joshua going for the first time here along the north on, on the uh, east side and even a little bit of a street and one house wall there. Some brand new stuff that we were really excited. Again, just a couple stones that have been identified. Well, you can see those are the stones, the specific stones that have been identified. We don't know how deep it goes yet, but that was that's what we're there for. So that was very exciting stuff for us. We have a local shepherd that uh, walks his, his uh, sheep right through our dig site every day. You leave your lunch out, it's gone. Uh, about 100 sheep wander through. The shepherd, the shepherd, we talked to the shepherd, needed an interpreter, talk to the shepherd. He said, I've been to Disneyland. I, they, they, now, well, maybe he's lying, but they all been here. And, uh, and, he, and so those are two of his dogs. They, they take turns, I guess, and they just camp out. They'll, they'll, they, won't, they won't camp out in the middle of our dig site while we're there, but they're off to the edge, and, uh, and the sheep don't bother us, just our lunches, and we try not to bother them. Um, uh, this is a scientific endeavor. It's laid out on a north-south grid. You saw the, the, the picture of that grid earlier with the uh, uh, site plan. 
surveyor lays everything out, every one of those black tents is an excavation square where somebody's working. I can't remember this master seminary student from last year who dug with us. That's right. And he found um, that's a sling stone. The Bible says there were two battles fought at the city of Ai, and there are sling stones everywhere, and that's his. He didn't get to bring it home, unfortunately, but uh, he was the one that got to find it. And I, I, I think that was his bath towel that he was swearing on his head there. And then um, Dr. Gasanti came, spent most of the dig grading papers. <laughs> he, did, um, he did come out and dig, and his technique was so terrible, we said, why don't you just sift the dirt that the girls dig? <laughs> And so he did, and he's, and he's doing a fine job of sifting and looks, had a good attitude about it. You can see, smiling there. But after, now he's sifting the dirt because he's supposed to find the good stuff, right? And that's the reason you sift it. Uh, you, want it you want to sift out the dirt and you find, want to find the good stuff. But he uh, kept missing it, so we had these two guys with metal detectors who then after Mike would sift the dirt, they would go over the dirt with their metal detectors and find all the coins that he missed. And, um, and the, I don't remember, I'm not sure that really happened, Mike, but uh, we, we actually had a professional, a prof archeo archeologists have typically, uh, traditionally not used metal detectors because with a metal detector, you dig holes and in archeology, span you peel layers back, you don't dig holes. And so uh, traditionally we've not used them, but in recent years in Israel, they've really come up with some very good ways to use the metal detectors appropriately. So we actually had a professional at the site who, uh, who did it with us and taught a couple of young guys, their families, their uh, uh, f American family who lives in Jerusalem. There's quite a few American families who are there. They have jobs, but they're there for ministry, both to Palestinians and to Jews. And uh, they were there and uh, they spent a lot of time with us. I believe we found 50 coins this season. And um, uh, here's a, just a, just a quick look. This is a bronze coin of King Herod. Uh, then there's Lisa who found a silver coin of King Demetrius. And uh, the silver coin is older and made of silver. And yet the bronze coin of Herod is more valuable. And it's simply because they were both in mint condition. Uh, both are really museum pieces. A lot of things we find aren't, but those were. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the bronze Herodian coin is more valuable, not because it's older, not because the material is more valuable, but because there's fewer of them, and ours is one of the, one of the finest. Uh, and we won't read through the list, but these are the list of coins that were found in our New Testament house, and Mike did help, find us, help us find some of those. And they just run through the entire New Testament era, all these people, their names are mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, and, and we just had the whole story right down to year two of the first Jewish re revolt in 68 AD. It's the last coin we had, nothing again until the Byzantine period. And then this is just some of the uh, weapons that were found. Uh, sling stone, uh, the haft of a, of a bronze spear, um, uh, two uh, spear points, uh, stone points. And uh, there's a whole pile of, uh, of, of sling stones, basically the size of billiard balls, and they weigh about nine ounces each. Um, you, and it, they, were, they were chipped. They, they're flint nodules and, and, a, and soldiers. Those are government issue. Uh, you know, the Bible says David used a, a smooth stone from the brook. These are government issue uh, sling stones. And a soldier would uh, pick up a flint nodule, chip it down, carry it with him, find another one, chip it down. And so they would make them the same basic uh, size um, and shape, size for weight, so you don't have to keep changing every time you uh, made another throw. And the same, the shape was uh, most aerodynamic. And then here was a, a Canaanite infant burial that was found uh, at the site. Uh, there's actually five vessels, one, two, three, four, and then the major jar and the jar itself was the coffin that the infant was found in. There it is, there's all the pieces. And uh, when we put it back together, we noticed 
that we didn't, we didn't lose these pieces. It had been made this way because the body was slipped in from the, from the underneath side, uh, not, not uh, able to go through the neck. Typical jar from the time of Joshua, from the time of the city of Ai. And this was a burial of a child burial inside our site. And that's, uh, that was what was left of the, of the little guy uh, from the burial. Now, I started off by saying archaeology shows us we can trust the Bible for the past. I want to say to you, this is nothing new for you, but if we can trust the Bible for the past, for history, then we can and we should also trust the Bible for the future, eternity. Now, when I would talk like that to you, I'm I'm preaching to the choir. Um, And in our average church, hopefully we got this straight. But... Let me be honest with you. Um, one of the things that even some of us, if, if we were going to be real today about our deal, we can trust the Bible for the past, for history. We can and should trust the Bible for the future, for eternity. But we really also need to learn how to trust the Bible for the present, learning how to live one day at a time. And if I can be honest, as a guy who has spent my whole adult life, I started a church when I was 22. As a guy who spent his whole adult life in ministry, and at one level or another, one of the biggest problems we have in people, among people who believe what we believe, we're right about history, we're right about eternity, but we're really struggling on learning how to live it one day at a time. And I want to encourage you to trust the Bible for history and for eternity. But you got that settled, I hope. But you really need to learn how to trust it to walk every day, one day at a time. And i got to be honest, archaeology is one of the starting points to help me in my confidence for the Scriptures. If I can trust it for that, and I can trust it for that, then I ought to be able to trust it for today. And I'm happy to report that really does work. Well, just um, one more thought for you. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, Two, nine, and it's a verse most of you know. Um, Eye is not seen, nor ear heard, neither is entered into the heart of man. The things God has prepared for those who love him. I, I made a commitment at age uh, uh, 18 to trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I went off to Liberty University graduated and started a church at age 22. And, and I, I was so unqualified, I refer to it as sanctified ignorance. I just didn't know any better that I really wasn't capable of starting a church. But God can do those kind of things and he used me in spite of all my failings and all my inabilities and all my shortcomings and there were so many. And, and my, my life and my ministry has continued to progress in the most amazing ways. It was a lifetime dream for me to do archaeology, just to get to go on a dig one time. I thought, this is, this, this is the end. I couldn't ask for any more than that. And now I get to run two digs. I get to go twice a year. And that's not even my real job. The God of the Bible has got the coolest plan for your life. Now, yours probably, maybe it does, but yours probably doesn't involve archaeology. That that was my deal. That That was the desire of my heart that God gave me. But you've got you've got desires in your heart. Uh you've got dreams in your life. I'm just here to remind you that the God of the Bible does that kind of stuff and my life is an example. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's happening in your life. But you can trust him for today. And he's got the coolest plan for your life in the future. And I want to encourage you to work it and walk it. And then to pass it on to somebody else. And I know you believe all this. But believing it's one thing. And and being able to actually live it honestly is something else. And I am so imperfect at it that it's embarrassing. But it's working for me. And I want to encourage you to live it and walk it and experience. Not just be intellectually accurate and correct with all that you know and theologically right, 
but live it and walk it because it's such an exciting trip because you have no idea the cool things God wants to do in your life and then through you in the lives of somebody else. I think archaeology helps foster that whole process. I think digging at Kirbet El Makata next year would be a great idea. And I'd love to have some of you join us. And maybe not this year, maybe it'll be later. Maybe you'll join another archaeological dig. Maybe you'll never really get involved in the dirt over there. But I want to remind you, archaeology helps us to trust the Bible for history. It helps us, and, and we can also trust the Bible for eternity. But please learn how to also trust the Bible for today, for the present. Learning how to live one day at a time. Should I pray or should I? I'll pray. Bow with me, please. <clears throat> Father, it's a, it's a really great privilege to be at uh, the Master Seminary. I'm really excited for all of these students because I did sit in the same kind of place where they are. And I had all kinds of questions and doubts and fears. But I've, I have watched now over these 40 years, you do just the most amazing things. And I can't explain it, and I know I'm not worthy. But that's who you are and what you do. So I commit my brothers and my sisters in this room to your very best. May we, may we trust you for history. May we trust you for eternity. And we, may we learn how to walk in faith one day at a time. Thank you for Jesus. He is the one that's made the difference in my life. And I'm trusting in the lives of my brothers and sisters. And I pray that we'll honor him in what we do just for today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.